Okay, so today is December 26, 2021, the day after Christmas. Happy Christmas to those who uh, celebrate it. And I just want to take this moment to also thank everyone for uh, this, for those who did the, the sigil charging on the 21st. Uh, I think that was great. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't know how, how do you want to continue this meeting, so whoever wants to. Uh, start it off oh, yeah i just wanted to draw attention also to yeah thanks everybody for the sigil thing was great but um i also wanted to draw attention to the james webb telescope um yesterday flawless launch of that thing but i think that's that's epochal that's um i'm pretty well convinced in my mind that will be the last look our species gets into deep space so it's it's really kind of like a zenith of science. I think that the LHC was the last look we'll get at the really small stuff. And James Webb is the last look at the really big stuff. Because I can't see them doing much more of these big science projects. So the James Webb is 10 billion, I think. I think the LHC was 4 billion. Um, but to, to do a bigger cyclotron than the LHC, you would, um, you would need you know, 20 billion or so. I, I think governments are going to be in trouble now fiscally. Um, I think we're heading for fiscal collapse. So I, I can't see these big projects being done again. So this is probably our, our last look. It's, it's, um, and I think there'll be great things that come out of it. But it's, to me, it's kind of emotional because it probably is the end of science. It's probably the end of the science project. So that thing's going to go out from a million miles away from Earth and park in uh, Lagrange Point 2 and uh, just look into deep space. And so uh, it's 20 times more powerful than the Hubble in the, in, in, in the infrared range. So it's we're going to see some amazing things. But anyway, it was such a big day yesterday. I think it was, that was quite something. Uh, way bigger than Apollo, easily bigger than Apollo 11 or walking on the moon. generally recognized that way but yeah that was I just want to raise that yeah anybody uh, got anything else to say can i uh because you drew the the comparison or the connection to the cosmic vision of uh talked about in the uh bhagavad gita and uh you know you link to the uh chapter there uh, can, can I just read that little bit at the end? Because I thought it was really good. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, This is at the end of the conversation between Krishna and Arjuna, where Krishna's uh, giving Arjuna a glimpse of the... Uh, he's given him the cosmic vision, the, the sort of total perspective vortex, I guess. And uh, Krishna says... Um, it is extremely difficult to obtain the vision you have had even the gods long always to see me in this aspect. 
neither knowledge of the Vedas, nor austerity, nor charity, nor sacrifice can bring the vision you have seen. But through unfailing devotion, Arjuna, you can know me, see me, and attain union with me. Those who make me the supreme goal of all their work and act without self-attachment, who devote themselves to me completely and are free from ill will for any creature, enter into me. And I think, uh, you know, what he was trying to get across by mentioning that was that, uh, you know, in a way, the, this telescope is trying to do something. Uh, sorry, Hugh, I don't mean to put words into your mouth, but I'm imagining what you're trying to say is that this telescope is doing something that uh, has been done in other ways a long time ago and that probably um, we need to recover the way those ancient people saw into the cosmos without having to do it the hard way and spend $10 billion and go out into space and, you know, pillage half the planet for the resources and the energy and all the rest of it to do it when you could just have stayed at home. Um, but, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think what they will see is uh, infinity. So what what we're getting a look at is infinity and uh, i don't think they will realize what they're looking at so i think that science will close we must be in the last chapter of science and i think science will close with more questions um, open than it's resolved so the, the james webb telescope i think will be destined to to raise you know deep questions and unexpected ones and then that will be it <laughs> which is the exact opposite of what it's supposed to do everybody wants to close the book on science they want a you know definitive closure and you know completeness but there are lots of hints that it doesn't work that way i, w I always thought that the lhc they made a big mistake they they're looking at the obvious and not seeing it if you if you look at the lhc and what the lhc found the, the standard model doesn't really hold together, but if you, the standard model has five particles, um, and so they probably the same thing. They're probably the same force. It's probably electromagnetism and some fundamental force. It's probably not four forces. Now they're trying to get five, but there there probably isn't four forces. They're mis mistaking something very basic. But you can see. I always thought, you know, those five basic particles then have um, you know, heavy partners. So they have five more um, symmetrical heavy partners and then another load of super heavy particles in, in a definite ratio. And then they think that's the end of you know the particle model plus the Higgs. But I, I think it's obvious is what they're looking at three sets and you think like, well, there must be a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. There must be, you know, they're not looking at particles. They're looking at kind of an echo of the, the basic five particles. So if you, you know, they only think that the, you know, these three classes of five, because that's how much energy they've got in the LHC. But I think it's obvious that if you had more energy, you would see that there's another row and then another row, and they will just get heavier and heavier, just uh, in the same kind of uh, increments, the same ratios. So the, the super heavy particles, so, yeah, I think I think what most people think the LHC is doing is it's smashing atoms and then they're having a look at them. But it's not. It's I think I've said before, it's creating particles. So it's it's getting hadrons, um, heavy you know, heaviest particles, giving them lots and lots of kinetic energy with a kind of a rail gun, and then smashing them into each other. So it's it's transferring, you know, kinetic energy and into into particles into mass with you know e equals mc squared so the, the it's creating those particles so all the particles you can see in the standard model those are not discovered those are manufactured in the lhc so it's it's a very important point because it implies that it, you know if you had more and more energy you could uh, find more and more particles it's, it's
they think that they've closed the book, but you can see very, they, they have no reason, there's no theory for why you have three ranks of these five particles. And it's like, well, it's kind of obvious, it's it's a pattern, you know, and the pattern must be an infinite. They must have, after the three, there must be a fourth and a fifth <laughs> rank of five. So it's, it's staring them in the face, but they, you know, they can't see it. Um, and so that in the very small, it's, you know, it's got how much energy there is. You can, you can create any particle because it's, you know, a particle, they're thinking of it as a thing and it's not, it's not any more of a thing than a wave is uh, on the sea. So it's, um, it's kind of like an illusion created by energy in space. So you can, you can see that the LHC is, is saying that, no, it's infinite. It's just however much energy you put in, you can create a heavy, heavy particle. Um, and so they can see this, the, the standard models of failure, but they, they teach it to all the kids is with great success, but it's not. It's, uh, they're hiding the fact that it doesn't really work. And um, the I think it's the same in the super large. Is uh, We have this kind of lame idea of the universe as an expanding universe, like we're on the inside of a balloon. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not like that at all. They, the Hubble and all that stuff, they, none of that stuff works. Inflation, or Big Bang, none of them work. They just, they kid, all, they tell all the kids it works, but it's like, they know it's all shit. But uh, you know, when you when you look and study that stuff, you can see that this it's telling you something that they're not seeing. There's something fundamental in this. Um, uh, you know, just just we have a completely involuted or upside down. But I think, yeah, I think uh, James Webb will, will show you that. that they will. They're looking back, you know, back in time to towards the Big Bang is what they think they're doing, but I think mean, that's quite really how the universe works. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, I just thought to say that. Is it Ryan? Is it? Oh. Oh. No. Um. Yeah. So so anyway, we'll we'll see because it's um, I don't know. It's a couple of years, I think, before it's commissioned and really up and running, but it'll start making discoveries in a couple of years. But they'll, they'll probably be overshadowed by all the disasters and crises coming hard and fast and on Earth. And it, it just, it seems, you know, the Bhagavad Gita seems to be relevant. <laughs> because the, the, the Bhagavad Gita, with that passage, right, what that the Bhagavad Gita is talking about there is, it's not clear whether it's prophecy in the future or history. So they take it as history. It's basically the the Pallavas and the Pandavas, the the two families. It's kind of like exactly where we are, the forces of good and evil. It's 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 obviously an Aryan trope because we get we get it in the Bible again. It's a, you know, it's on the, the field of Armageddon. It's basically the field of Armageddon is Kurukshetra for the Hindus. So it's the same, it's the same people, it's a branch of the same people. And they they may be talking about a battle in the past or uh, the final Armageddon. I think it's more likely it's a prophecy of the future. And it's really strange because what Arjuna, you know, Arjuna is, it's all, the whole piece is out of the Mahabharata. The Mahabharata is 8,000 volumes or something. It's a vast library of writing. But anyway, the, the crown jewel of it is the Bhagavad Gita, which is like the Hindu's Bible. And the, Can I just drop in a point here? Yeah, yeah. For anyone for anyone who's interested in it, uh, I think it's still on YouTube. Is a uh, uh, It used to be on television here. It was a series, I think, of like 12 one-hour episodes uh, produced by Peter Brook, and it's, uh, it's the sort of condensed Mahabharata. And it really is very good. For anyone who sort of doesn't want to read a gigantic thing or, or anything, it's it really gives um really um good uh, feel for it yeah so the the story in the gita is you know arjuna is a prince he's about to go into battle in kurukshetra it's basically it's a, it's also the battle of troy it's the same as the battle of troy it's the same damn thing um and so yeah, it's, it's an Aryan story. The, 
they call themselves Arians. And the greatest of Arians, Arjuna, he's kind of like a champion Achilles. And so uh, it starts off with Arjuna's despondency. So Arjuna's despondent because he doesn't want to go into this final battle because he's related to the Pandavas and the Pallavas. So, the, the, so, you know, he sits down on his shield. Karavas. The what? Karavas. Karavas isn't Karavas the pa Pandavas. Pandavas and the Karavas. Yeah, Pandavas. I think, yeah. Yeah. Pandava. yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Not the Pallavas. It, it is a huge Pallava. <laughs> but the... Um, yeah, so so anyway, he's um, he doesn't want to kill all his you know relatives in in effect, and so so he's a son. And then Arjuna, who's his companion, is is I mean um, Krishna, who's his companion and God, um, his instructor, just instructs him. And and what he instructs him is kind of funny because he says. In essence, they go through all the philosophy of Hinduism and, and what Arjuna eventually comes out, down to after this vision, the cosmic vision. Uh, he says, the, the conclusion is to say, therefore, Arjuna, fight. And the reason he gives is he's saying, because none of these people are born or will die. So he's saying you might as well go in and kill them. <laughs> because no, no one is born and no one dies. So it's, it, it's quite a... It's kind of a bunch, you know, gut punch in a way, because he's saying you know, that the good is doing doing your duty, and the good, they're they're big on duty. Um, but he's saying you know doing your duty and fighting is important. It's kind of a <clears throat> it's almost transhumanist. He's saying like you know evolution and pro you know progress and stuff and doing the evolutionary fight <clears throat> is more important. Than not killing or you know, a hamsa or something like that. And it's very, very apropos for our times and for XR and stuff like that, where they say, you know, above all, non violence and be good and unity. And then and Arjuna is saying the exact opposite. He's saying, go in there, take heads. <laughs> and the reason is, he says, because, you know, that there's only one self. So these are just expressions of the self. It's more important that you're going to break heads. It's a startling conclusion for Christians. It's the exact opposite of Christianity in a way. So, yeah, it's it's well worth pondering. <laughs> but anyway, it, it is exactly where we are today. We are, everybody can feel that we're coming to a big showdown. You know, the transhumanists and these, well, basically Saturn, Satan. But this Satan. is the, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, what you were just saying about the telescope is that um, it's a kind of degraded version of what they should be doing um, in the same way that what is manifesting as transhumanism in society now is a degraded version of a kind of a spiritual perspective that would ideally be the case. So you, what we're getting is these, these sort of... Um, Dirty mirror versions of the of the actual thing, I guess. Yeah, they they kind of dumbed down um, attempts at rediscovering the same knowledge. You see, when when particle physicists were a little bit brighter back in the heyday of particle physics, you know, kind of Feynman's time and Murray Goldman and those guys, then they all came to the same kind of very zen-like state which they've lost today by the time you get to higgs and so it's just like it's pathetic absolutely fucking pathetic but the you know they were more enlightened i mean the physics is dumbed down to idiocy to kindergarten like idiocy by by the time you get to ed witten and it's, it's like it's beyond a joke that we're still giving these guys money as well is, is incredible but yeah they're not really doing science anymore it's 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 difficult to tell what the fuck they're doing, but the um, any, any, anyway, you know, Murray Gell-Mann and real physicists and that of that era would be horrified at the shit that they're doing in their late two. But the but you see, all those guys they came up with these kind of Zen answers. They came up, with, you know, like Feynman came to the conclusion that hang on a minute, they're all the same particle. 
So there's, there's only one particle, and it's just going backwards and forwards in time. So, the, you know, the, they called it like one, the tachyon and stuff like that didn't, didn't work out. But the tachyon was called a tachyon because it was, it was a joke because it was considered tacky. But the, the tachyon was a, was a, Feynman didn't publish anything about it's all the same particle because the maths just defeated him. But they all came to a similar kind of conclusion. They say, like, look, when we look at a proton or an electron or something like that, it's tachyon, all this particle zoo. They had a strong feeling like, you know, if you could just get the maths right, they're all the same particle. They, it's, it, no, I um, don't mean they're the same type of particle. It means that there's one particle that's going backwards and forwards in, in time and space. One particle, <laughs> a singularity. And I think that's right. I think, I think the whole universe, we're sitting inside that sing singularity. That's, that's why the universe looks like it's expanding. It's not really, it's a fundamental mistake we're making. But... The, yeah, they they came to the you know they they wrote books like the Dancing Wooly Masters and stuff like that because they they got to all these trippy Zen insights that were just straight from Hinduism and then it kind of degenerated from that. So you know I don't think you, you'll get anywhere going down. But I mean they they got to the end of the road at the LAC. Now they just say like, well, what do we do next? Oh, we need a bigger particle accelerator with more energy. And then that now they want 20 billion. <laughs> it's like nobody's going to give them 20 billion. The thing is, there must be some uh, sort of uh, subconscious acknowledgement uh, of the understanding that those earlier physicists had. Uh, I think it was out, so, uh, a photo I saw once, uh, and I think it was taken in the uh, grounds outside of the, the uh, LHC um, is a, is a um, large um, sculpture uh, of um, Kali uh, in, in a, you know, with all of the, the classic, sorry, I can't describe it very well, but apparently it's very large, it's beautifully done. And I think that's where it is outside of that collider, which is kind of acknowledging all of the, the uh, deep understanding of it. Um, but you know, it's as, as, as though they walk through the the door into the air conditioned space inside, and and it all just uh, vanishes and it's forgotten about. Yeah, I thought Kali was the Kali statue was at the Perimeter Institute. I didn't know it was at the. I, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure. I I, I yeah. thought it might have been the Collider, but I'm I could be wrong. Yeah. Yeah, the the Perimeter Institute guys are. It's almost a joke. They call themselves the Perimeter Institute because they are on the fringe. But they, they, the Perimeter Institute did loop quantum gravity and all this, you know, those guys. And so they, they are kind of um, bong smoking <laughs> types. Um, but uh, no, the, the, the hard mainstream guys who like siphon money out of the EU and stuff, there's, you know, like pigs and those guys, they kind of don't have any imagination. See what I think I mentioned before that the see they used to have insight and then they used to express their insights mathematically. But we've dumbed down to the point where we just rearrange symbols. So it's just you know, by the time you you look at the, the Higgs boson, it's just crap. I mean the the Higgs boson is doesn't it even exist. They didn't detect the Higgs boson, they just detected uh, a decay of two photons at that energy level, at the correct energy level. So out of the, you know, millions and millions of collisions a second, they found one where they can see two photons. You know, the, the Higgs boson is too, too short-lived to be detectable. So they just look for two photons splitting off, a particle that breaks into two photons. And that's it. They found, they found one image where the, the, the thing broke, and the next thing they know, they're giving out Nobel Prizes, and Higgs is bursting into tears, and it's like, come on, guys, get real. This is bullshit. This is not science. Yeah. But Have you got your got, engines running tonight? They've got, they've got the public right fools. Luckily for them, the public is dumbed down, and, you know, faster than they are. But I mean, by the time you get to guys like Neil deGrasse Tyson and stuff, it's like, what the fuck? 
let this guy in. <laughs> it's like, I mean, you can imagine Neil deGrasse Tyson and, you know, it wouldn't have shaped you in the time of uh, Feynman and you know, Einstein and that. Imagine Neil deGrasse Tyson at the Solvay conference in 1927. It's like, he wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have been able to get a word in edgeways. They would have laughed at him. Yeah, but again, you've got, uh, uh, in these more recent times since then, not just in science, but it, it, everywhere, these self-serving systems. That you get these people into a, a little niche, and the sole function of it is not what they're doing, but the self-perpetuation of, of their their um, cosy little arrangement. Um, you know, they just keep, in, in a way, turning out things that are incomprehensible to normal people, uh, ordinary people, makes them look even more exalted because uh, rather than assume that these people are just stupid, people assume that they're so incredibly rarefied that we can't even begin to understand them. Um, and, and they become even more exalted. Uh, it's the yeah, Chauncey Gardner folks. They're all like, uh, you know, Chauncey Gardner's. Everybody's seeing like really profound things in nothing, you know, the guys. They, you know, as if they're asking really profound questions. Why is there something rather than nothing? And what they mean is why is the rate, you know, that translates to them as why or the, is there more matter than antimatter? It's like, come on, is that the big, best question you can come up with? Seriously? <laughs> it's all rather pathetic. Yeah, all the advances that we made is. It's the same in software and everything. It's like nobody's really made any advances. What everybody's riding on is the hardware guys. So the LHC and it's, you know all the advances in robotics and machinery and stuff, they all been due to the, the hardware guys. The, the guy, hardware guys are getting better at photolithography and material science and stuff like that. But the James Webb telescope, is, is not a miracle of understanding. It's not a miracle of science. It's it's a miracle of a, um, engineering. Right? So it's they just got the only reason why you can do the James Webb Telescope is because the engineers have figured out all these exotic materials and processes and stuff and you know neodymium magnets and all of these things. But all these you know everybody thinks oh you know look how things are advancing. No, the robots. Robotics and AI and stuff hasn't advanced in 30 years. They're doing robots that I did when, when I was in my 20s. They're the same shit. They don't well, do well, any more than today than, than 30 years ago. The only thing is we didn't have all the motors and stuff. We were all limited by the servos and, and stuff and then the computing power. So the computers have got faster and more compact. But it's just due to photolithography. It's just due to better material science. It's not due to any advances in science. Well, to, to answer to what Gary was saying on another domain than physics, the one I know, medicine, is the same thing. People have, have kind of gone into their little niche and they were self-praising each other in this or that progress in robotic uh, surgery or new prosthesis or new drug or all these things, but medicine has made no progress in, in probably 50 years, if we think of it really. Actually, it has progressed in wrecking the life of millions and millions of people. Um, so, you know, we're in the same conundrum there, totally. Yeah, look, look at fusion and, and fusion. Fusion's got nowhere in forever. And all the nanotechnology and stuff, everybody's like, oh, it's, you know, it's just like fusion. It's always, you know, we're just, just, just on the cusp of a breakthrough. It's like, we're always just on the cusp of a breakthrough, but it never comes. Is it, in 2001, when we, sequ we sequenced the human genome, they, they all said, okay, that's it. This is, you know, now we homo deus. Now we can change our own genome and we can, you know, alter anything to do anything. And it's like, you know, we'll find the, We'll find the gene for schizophrenia and the gene for Alzheimer's and the gene for every autism and everything. It was like, they, what did they find? Fuck all. Fuck all. Goose egg. Didn't find the gene for fuck all. Apart from things that they knew already, like Tay-Sachs or <laughs> some genetic illness. But, you know, that Craig Fenter and those guys in like 2010, he's going to do 
synthetic life. So then you, you know, a sequenced life in a computer, basically a, a gene sequence of manufactured life. And, and it's like, no, he didn't. He just copied the gene sequence and, and strung them together like a, a necklace just from a known yeast. If you say, like, nobody knows how a yeast works, nobody knows the first thing on how to actually construct, um, you know, a strand of DNA that can replicate itself from scratch. It's like, we, we don't know. We don't know how it does it. So you can copy it, but that, that, that's just cargo culting. It, it just, again, it's engineering. Is the He's using gene sequencing and stuff that is just uh, nanotech, that it's just engineering. That's that's the marvel. It's, the sequencing and the, the manufacturing of, of these, you know, the assembly of these genes are just, they just, it's just, they got better hardware. That's all. They, they haven't, they didn't, they haven't got anywhere with all of this stuff, but everybody's waiting, you know? And that's, it's like, uh, but these guys are freaking dangerous because they've taken over the world. They've, uh, it's, it's again, it's this, damn thing that Eisenhower warned about as a scientific and technological elite. So look at this. It's like, you know, this whole pandemic has been managed by scientists. Neil deGrasse Tyson said in an interview, well, this is a test for humanity. It's a test to whether you can listen to scientists. So we've listened to scientists. And I'm just telling you, there's big shit coming down the pipe. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm looking at this stuff and I'm just, I, I, I can't shake this thing about this HIV. It just the more I look at it, the more they're hiding some shit. And it's it's looks to me like it's airborne HIV. And so what's really scary is the 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 bits that, that I put that thing up on XMN, the the about the Indian paper where they actually label all that it's called uncanny, you know, bread, all these inserts that clearly look like they're on the spike protein. So the the vax is making these HIV components. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and saying, like, this could be a disaster. I mean, I'm looking at things. I mean, maybe I'm all out to see, but, <clears throat> you know, there, there's weird shit going on because, the, the you know, with the G variant, these guys, uh, it's the people that actually have the jab that get it more. They being infected more than naive people. I just put a, a thing up there, a paper up there. No one will report this. But it's like, the, the, so what's a good reason for that? I'll tell you. I mean, maybe Sophie better say something about this, but a good reason is because they've injected HIV and it's immunocompromised people. You see, what, what, what really tipped me off was that the G variant has exactly the same symptoms as HIV, identical. And what, what happened was, they never, you know, from HIV, what happens is it, you know, you get a kind of a cold-like thing, and then you have about a year where it just stabilizes. And what's happening is the retrovirus is is just eating up your T cells. It's it hijacks your T cell, so so your antibodies go down and down and down and down, and eventually you die of some horrible cancer or disease or some thrush or something like that because of you can't fight off um, pathogens. So you, you're going to die of some weird shit. But but it's it's a year or two later. In the meantime, you just see your immunity going down and down and down. So it took them an awful long time to square up, you know, all these gay guys dying of weird shit. And then, it, you know, all the way back to, to the a virus that does it. It took them years and years and years. And even today, some people don't don't accept uh, the connection with HIV, but, but you know, the, that was in, in 1981, then finally they, they sequenced it. But, uh, but you know, that, Sophie, what do you say about that? Because, I mean, it's, it's, you would, you see, what would happen is you would see exactly what you see now in the epidemiology. You would see people um, that actually have the jab. You, you need more and more to keep it, because, it, yeah, sure, it's defensive for a little while, like three months, but then overall, it's degrading your immune system. So, I, I mean, it's early days, but I, that's what I'm looking for. I don't, I don't know what to say, really. Um, I mean, um, the IV thing is, is, a, is, a, is a probability that has to be absolutely 
taken into account and, and looked at seriously, especially the silence that is made around it, that every time I see something that is ushered down, I, I get my doubts. But uh, yeah, medically, yes, of course. And also the fact that uh, the people who, who are getting this, uh, this job, uh, this time for the um, alpha uh, type, uh, is not involving the T cells. So the immunity is not going to be as good as somebody who had uh, they, you know, somebody who had a spontaneous uh, early infection and who will have developed some T cells that will be uh, completely different uh, to the to the people who have, who have been jabbed. So now, if you're saying that in the because I I don't know if you're saying that in um, that injection there is in the spike protein some domains that are typically um, HIV-like, or then we're going to have a we, it, we could have a potential catastrophe, all right. Uh, if that is, if the, if, if what you say is, in that scenario, yeah, that's for sure, because you'll have people yeah. who have already had a suppressed immunity due to a, an artificial uh, immunity, no T cells and T cells that will also be damaged. So, yeah, 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 yeah. You will, we'll have a look at the paper that I just, I just highlighted there. But a, a paper just came out in the last few days, and it's what it's saying is. Naive candidates, that's in other words, the un so the unjab, the refused pricks, um, actually do way better than people that have actually got it or people that have been been jabbed. So it's it's kind of like um, you know, you've got to find a reason why. And I say, well, an obvious reason is the that the actual thing is is compromised the immune system. One of the uh, papers that you Articles. It was quite a while ago now. Uh, uh, something to do with the vaccinations or the or the virus. I can't remember what it was, but they actually used the term vaccination addiction in that, which I'd never heard anybody use before. And it's probably don't, don't use the V word. <laughs> okay. Well, whatever. It's too late now. Um, um, I thought it was interesting in view of what you just said a minute ago, whereby you're in this kind of downward spiral where. You've, take, you, you've had this injection, it's, it's tending to cause your problems, uh, and but you can only get out of it by having some more, uh, but that's just getting you into a, you, it's sort of helping you out, but then it makes it worse, and then you have more and it helps you out, but then you still get worse, and you're in this downward spiral with it, um, which I guess is a good definition for addiction. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, well, We'll we'll see as time time uh, goes by, but uh, yeah, I think that there might be a downward spiral, and it, it's gonna. But there's something fishy going on. I can't shake it because if you do searches on this, they they actively trying you to make sure that you don't make the HIV connection. So they. Anything on YouTube and that offer you, you know, you can you can see videos. They're gone. I mean, the, the whole account is gone. <laughs> but like, you can you can see on the history that somebody said, you know, some, something about you know airborne HIV or something like that. And then the, the whole account the is gone, not just the video. The other thing was that article, the medium one you posted three days ago. That was a good article, um, E and. Um, and it's gone. Yeah, the guy has it says the author has removed it. He was talking about the whole, you know, um, that we're in this COVID doom loop. Um, I think that was what the article was called about. You know, the the African problem, and he was there to tell you, yeah, like this is bad news, and it's going to combine with other serious diseases, and that we got lucky this time with Omicron because it was a more combining with a cold, like. Um, you know, common cold possibly, and that was well as mild. But next time it could be that it combines with, say, Lassa fever or something really horrible, basically. Um, so, yeah, it was a good article, that, but yeah, it's gone. Yeah, I was trying to look at it again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't believe this uh, cold combined with a cold thing. It, it, cold is a rhinovirus. So, I think um, the, you know, the, um, COVID is a, a lentivirus, and then HIV is a, re, a retrovirus. So the the retrovirus and lentivirus can can combine because people have done experiments; they've done it, and so they 
Say that again. That is le lentivirus. What did you say? Retroviruses and lentivirus is the family of RNA viruses that uh, is SARS and MERS. And those, those guys. Um, and H5N1, I think. But you know, bird flu. But um, uh, yeah, the, the the cold is um, rhinovirus. I think it's um, you know, it's I, I don't. I don't believe anything about this, the cold thing, because um, it's called a rhinovirus because rhino is uh, from your nose, um, it's from the Greek for nose or something. But the um, uh, the um, the the uh, I think the retroviruses. I'm not sure. I'm not on solid ground here, but I think the retroviruses and the lentiviruses, they both go for your lungs because they go for ACE2 receptors and they go for your lymph nodes and stuff like that because they're really ha hacking into your, your T cells. So the, there's the CD4 and CD8 proteins. And so the, the, the um, you know, the, um, uh, it would explain why this thing mutates so damn fast because um, HIV mutates like crazy fast, like uh, like uh, a mutation rate is like uh, one mutation per division per cell. You know, it's it's ridiculous. Um, and so the um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, I mean it's it would explain a lot. Um, and and they 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 both hang out in the same places. So you know, either somebody did it deliberately or it happens by accident um, in, in some immunocompromised patient. But yeah, I mean, um, I, I think it's telling that this this oral therapy that mm, Pfeiffer just came out with, um, the uh, Paxo, Paxolovid or whatever it is, and it's, uh, it's I think it's uh, Renisivir is the, is the drug, but, but that's an AIDS treatment. That's an HIV treatment. So they brought out this drug, which is just a re you know the reason why it's been approved so quickly is because it's a standard um, HIV treatment. So so they're giving people a rebranded HIV treatment, and they say like I'm suspicious as hell. <laughs> Yeah, I'm getting more suspicious by the day as well. <laughs> I just keep like the way that everyone's reacting. Here, I just definitely think like the government, the, the answers that they're giving over, like it just, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Like yeah, it, they're it saying, oh, sense. you know, it's it's because like they're, now they're saying, oh, there's not going to be enough staff in the hospitals to treat everyone. But then yeah, on the flip right. side, they're saying that it, it's milder and everything. And you're like, if it's milder, then and those people are younger and fit and healthy in hospitals, then surely that if it was like that, then they would just say like you're going to just have to come to work like if you're like you know got milder symptoms but we need you like here at the, at the front line sort of thing i just don't there's something else about it as well and but my, brother, my sure. brother's um got someone who she works closely with, the, with one of the guys at the welcome trust and she's like acting real weird <laughs> she came back to christmas to stay with the family and two of them had had they they're like positive and they were staying in one room in the house but then she's going back each night like she's not staying there and i was like what's the point in that like why don't you just not go there at all i don't know there's loads of weird shit <laughs> i'm just like sus on everything now but tom, tom i don't know how it is in the uk but i'm in a country where the population is vaccinated in the 90 percent huh? the cases have started rising constantly first of all i cannot stand the word case because it's positive testing i think People are, uh, you know, there's this language that is extremely uh, uh, propagandist, saying cases, cases that in the, in the, in the subconscious of people, it re immediately hits, you know, somebody in hospital sick, dying, case, a case, a medical case. It's not that they are positive tests. The numbers that we're seeing everywhere on the charts, the the big curves going up, it's positive tests. Who has tested positive? It's not a case. Medically, yes, I agree. Yeah, you're completely and, right. And in Ireland, yeah. to finish what I was saying, it's just like there was about 6,000 cases at the beginning of December. There was about maybe a 1,000 in September. 
And suddenly, in last week, what they call cases again, it's gone up to 13,000. And, and the hospital, the hospitalizations haven't changed, the deaths haven't changed. So either it's mild, either it's long term problem, but we're we're in a, a a a storm in a teacup here and you know there is absolutely i don't know about england and for the hospitals and stuff like that but there's absolutely no uh no departments that are overwhelmed there's just this climate of fear put on people to say ah oh, you won't be able to have your hip replaced for your granny because there'll be all these unvaccinated covid people who are going to just you know take your but all that is total bullshit because the the the, the figures are showing uh, that the people who took uh, that lovely uh, little injection are actually uh, more uh, in proportion in hospitalizations than the ones that didn't. Um, you know, so, yeah, that's what we have here. An enormous population vaccinated and, and spiking. I and mean, for a little country like here, it's, it's nearly comical, you know. But what's happening is that people are crowding the testing centers because everybody's going berserk and there was not so much testing done last year and the year before obviously so it, all that is also numbers like you can't rely on any numbers it doesn't mean anything nothing yeah but you see this is why i'm getting conspiratorial this is why you see it yeah, the thing you always go for in conspiracies and living in south africa with second guessing the propaganda and the government and the information control is you look for shit that doesn't make sense and this is exactly one of the things is is they they clearly it it doesn't make sense why they the governments are going so nuts and and you know like you say it's a storm in a teacup well it's it's highly unlikely that the governments are going nuts over a storm in a teacup like israel as soon as you know this this thing was was announced israel closed its borders and they haven't opened them and you, you can see the, the videos all over the internet saying like, the hospitals are empty. This is all rubbish. And say like, well, put two and two together. It's like, it's, it's obviously an excuse about the, the hospitals. They must be terrified of the disease. So, and if it's mild, means that it's a long-term consequences. So it makes sense that if it's something like um, that hits your um, immunity or makes you immunodeficient. Um, so, in other words, it's airborne HIV. Then that would explain the, their um, their actions very well, because they they're all going nuts because this thing is going, going to have serious long term consequences. And um, you know, it's uh, the the actions are too severe. Given given the, the risks and all the, the stuff that we can see. So, you you know, you can't say, oh, well, they're, they're needlessly going nuts. I think the more likely thing is I would trust that they're going nuts for a reason and they're not telling us. How much does the um, um, temptation to make a authoritarian power grab add into that do you, do, you, do you really see that as a subsidiary issue or is they running in parallel no i don't i mean you know what what power grab they've always run under the assumption that they have absolute power i mean they, they've taken that for granted you can see it in all the disaster preparations and stuff so it i mean it's 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 just liberals that have this weird idea that somehow they have some power it's like you never had any power it's, it's just a an illusion they propagated. So it's like they're not making a power grab. It's like they've had absolute power all along. So it's like, so, you know, it's um, uh, what what they're doing, though, is is risking a backlash. So there are lots of videos about all these people around the world that are taking to the streets. They're everybody from the Jean to huge marches in Australia, they're not making the mainstream news. The mainstream news is trying to say that you know everything's under wraps, but they're clearly there's a rebellion. So it's the exact opposite. Is is they risking a rebellion, which is one of the things they're really scared of. And it's like, why would you risk a rebellion unless you really, really needed to? And so yeah, I mean you know Biden's gonna lose the next election hands down. So he wouldn't be doing that. 
if he, um, you know, unless he had a really, really solid reason. So that, I, I mean, I just come back again and again to they're hiding something. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, and then I, I suppose you could argue, well, if they were all about, yeah, public health and just safety of the population, then, I mean, well, they could have just, like, if they had a good idea of the what's really going on, um, or they do, and they could tell people, and then people would be terrified, and they could easily lock people down to try and stop that. But now it's just, like mitigation isn't it because that well that would be impossible wouldn't it i'm thinking out loud here i don't know <laughs> it's a kind of yeah kind of worms yeah, yeah i can't uh you know just speculating i can't really see if it is airborne hiv um i'm i'm not really sure why they don't just tell everybody because uh, uh if you said that people would be running to get the job So, I mean, the fact that they, they, you know, they're censoring any connection or anything like that connection is, uh, is strange, you know? Yeah, definitely. But have you actually, I mean, I'm not very good at searches and stuff, I'm just, but I've, I've looked a little bit at all that. And you're saying that they're censoring everything about connections with HIV and stuff, but I haven't found much of that all right. But is it because it's, I don't know how to look, or is it just that it's, uh, is it just on YouTube you have looked, or have you yeah, been on, 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 on YouTube and on Reddit. If I tried, okay. I've tried to post some things on Reddit from, and it looks to me that it's, it's, it's the, you know, basically speculating on HIV and the connection. And that, that's what does it. So it, it, it means that somebody's, been tasked with, you know, deliberately going in there and writing a bar. Well, maybe maybe we should all try to just, even if it's not, you know, post some stuff on subs that we don't even visit or belong to, just randomly, uh, and and see what comes out of it. Because without links really specifically to something that you say you, just a, a sort of candid, uh, naive uh, person who's putting a Oh, you know, it looks like in this article there is this that, and just let it go and see if we get messages from from Reddit that it's removed. I think it would add water to to our mill because, uh, yeah, that, that I, I'm oh, like you. When I see things that are being hidden, that are being censored, that's when my my uh, my signals go on. You know, it's uh... yeah. What well, I'd suggest is going go and ask the question. On, on some, you know, virology thing, or there must be lots on on Reddit and stuff. But, you know, I'd go on well, Twitter and Facebook and stuff and, and ask the question um, of, of virologists, say, like, what, you know, point them to the Indian paper and say, you know, what, what, what gives this? Well, could it be pointed to that publication of this African, South African patient who was uh, HIV positive and who contracted the SARS-CoV-2 and who developed a variant in an early stage, you know, because that was something that I was reading. I don't know, was it posted on, on Reddit or elsewhere? And it was quite common knowledge that it had been published by in, in South Africa that, you know, the hypothesis that that person could have produced <laughs> this. But I mean, even if you don't want to follow that line and if you think that it's um, engineered and everything. Still, it, it would be a good start. A good start to ask a question on a, on a, on a, on a, in a circle of people who who are a bit in the know. I don't know. Hugh, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering what what you said a, a minute ago about you know why they just don't tell everybody. <clears throat> but I'm I'm wondering if they're playing a game of mass psychology in that. Um, if you if everybody was in the same boat 
then all of the common tactics of divide and rule and of creating scapegoats are, are swept off the table. Sorry, I turned the video on. Um, you know, that the whole psychology of human social conduct, conduct that has been uh, manipulated by power elites would, would fall apart because you, you would then have uh, everybody in the same boat instead of some people being in uh, inferior positions or superior positions or, or you, you know, um, you, you, you couldn't, uh, you know, you've created an, an even landscape instead of an, an uneven one that you can take advantage of the differences. Uh, yeah, but except that things are nicely divided anyway. They don't, they don't need to divide them any more than they are. They were all nicely divided before all this. Yeah, so, but when you get some overriding nasty thing, you, you know, uh, that, that's just so major and, and so completely across the board and it tends to sort of subsume all the other uh divisions will start to seem a bit petty by comparison and lose their power. Uh, no, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. What, what makes a lot of sense is they, they're trying to avoid what people would do if that, if that was com common knowledge. So in other words, they might, um, they, might, uh, they might do a run on the drugs for that, that kind of thing. Um, so that's one reason why they wouldn't tell you what it is, because people might uh, run for, you know, HIV treatments and stuff. Um, uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it will unfold. But, I mean, I, I, I'd say one, one of the, the best ones you can think up is, is the darkest one of all, and that's that this is, is a massive deliberate eugenics thing. It's like, a, you know, the really, really bad conspiracy theory. But... These guys are all eugenicists. I've said this so many times. Craig, I've, uh, Craig Fenter. Craig Fenter is the guy who was the first to sequence the human genome. And he, uh, it's his genome. When, when they say, you know, the human genome and the human genome database, it's Craig Fenter's genome. He, he, he's such an arrogant um, egotist and narcissist that, that he, he's the guy who they, they got the, the genome from when they sequenced it. So... So he is Mr. Genome, and he's the first guy to synthesize life and stuff like that. But now he's a full-on eugenicist, um, and he's he's made lots of underhand comments about overpopulation. And uh, you know, he comes from a stable of guys with, which are population-controlled eugenicists. I mean, Craig Fenter himself has uh, has said once that um, uh, when they questioned him, you know, about playing God with, uh, you know, what happens if you make a synthesizer virus that, you know, goes out into the population and kills billions. He says, and effectively, he said, well, billions need to be killed. He said, it's like, if, if somebody is dying of a virus, um, do, they, do, you, do they really care? This is a quote from him. He says, like, he says, if somebody dies from a virus, do you think they really care that the virus was man-made or, or does it make any difference if it came from overpopulation and crowding and all the stuff that's going to happen anyway. It's like, whoa, dude, did you just say that? It's like, he, he's just said, you know, we might as well put a man-made virus out to control the population because the population is going to get all these pandemics and stuff because, uh, you know, it's we're overpopulated. And he said many things like that. But he comes from a whole stable. All of these guys are they, they, um, you know, all the guys doing gene therapies and all the Fauci's of this world, they're eugenicists. They're out and out population control eugenicists. I, I was looking at a comment there that Bob posted saying, um, if I were a billionaire, I would be trying to thin the herd. And then, to be honest, and it's hard to imagine this is not happening. Hey, Bob, have you something to say about that? That's interesting perspective, being in the mind of a No. Nope. 
I don't think Bob is on the call, right? We, we can't hear you, Bob. Your, your sound is, is off or you don't have any audio. You've just got visual. No, it's muted. Muted. Yeah, it's muted, maybe. I can't even see the microphone. Oh, yeah. Is Bob on the call? I don't think he is. Yeah, I can see. Anyway, we're... You just don't have a, an icon with the microphone, so your audio is probably off, Bob. That's why. Oh, okay. Now there's a mic, but... The mic appeared, and then it went away. You're not muted, but we can't hear you. It, it's it's very faint. It's very faint. It's just there somewhere. It's not loud enough. Anyway. No, I suppose I suppose one thing is that, like we said before, you know, from our side of the fence, it only really takes one crazy mad scientist, doesn't it? You know, maybe. <laughs> Oh, like some malicious person out of all those people, or well, they might be like a like fairly yeah dodgy bunch, so to speak. But um, you just need one like rotten one, maybe that really yeah did did sort of intend something, or to take advantage of this accidental leak, this accidental crisis. Um, yeah, or they're encouraged by others within that sphere. I don't know, it's just so many layers of complexity in this. So it doesn't, I don't think it's, yeah, you couldn't say that it's like one, like a bunch of guys in a room all like cackling. It's just like, yeah, history has a way of like dishing out weird coincidences and sort of opportunities, doesn't it, I suppose? Yeah, there, I mean, there was that anthrax guy in, in 2001. They never figured out that anthrax attack. And the... Um, but that that anthrax attack that was the weirdest thing that that was actually weaponized anthrax so what the hell that was is anybody's guess but it this probably is a, a lone wolf but the thing about this is is this is why I say that you know civilization cannot continue because um, you know there are eight billion people it's it's like if you know if one in a million people was a a rogue mad you know mad scientist you know that's um what is it eight million people or something that's the, that qualify and we we are at this stage where citizen scientists can can assemble all of these things you can assemble anything in your garage so it's like what how long before somebody does this i mean we're talking about all these state actors and all of these guys they're all up to their neck in this in bioweapons research this is what was going on at the, the Wuhan lab so it's, a, it's like you know you don't have to be a big state actor and uh, it's you don't need mega funding to do this you can do it in your garage so it's how how you know somebody can isolate this and start doing their own experiments and their garage quite successfully they uh this happened with the um bubonic plague i think it was only like last year or the year before and they they sequenced the whole thing uh and uh published the full details online for anyone to to access and basically said that well if you've got a CRISPR machine you can just pop it out and uh you know quite a few people remarked well who the fuck were these idiots what the hell did they publish the details for because uh, it uh, it would just basically let anyone with a little bit of money and, and the right knowledge to uh, to reproduce it. Um, yeah, you don't even need a rogue lab technician. It's basically like three D yeah. printing these days. Hmm. But yeah, I mean, this is why uh, you know how how these. You know, Ray Kurzweil type tech utopians think we just carry on. Regard, it's like, you know, how could we possibly carry on? I just cannot see a way. Where we we we're just so vulnerable to all of these things. As you know, we should be. <clears throat> you know, they should have been organizing society around uh, 
you know, coping with them, but instead, uh, you know, they were talking about Mars and stuff. <laughs> it's like, Come on, we're never going to go to Mars, not at this rate. Uh, I just wanted to remind you also to talk about the bubonic plague that this year, only in 20 and, uh, 2021, there's been 25 cases of bubonic plague in Madagascar. So it's not something that, you know, uh, or Middle Ages, you know, uh, London, whatever. It's it's there. It's just, no, don't, we're not even talking about engineering, you know. It's in nature. 25 cases in Madagascar this year. Probably. So it, it never quite disappeared. They're just enough to keep it going somewhere. Yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. no, but it's not a virus. pop up all the time. Yes, in your piss, this is a, mm. is a thing between a bacteria and a, it's a, and a virus. It's not, it's not a virus. It's completely different. But the, these dreadful things pop up all the time. There's like Ebola and stuff, outbreak that just got contained. There was some damn thing in Sudan or something that they think it just got contained, but that, that would have been a scary pandemic. I can't remember what that was. But, yeah, I mean, uh, there's uh, a little while ago, there was um, a doctor in Pakistan who was deliberately injecting, well, Suma was deliberate. He was, he was thrown in jail. He, was in, he injected thousands of kids with, um, with HIV. In, in Bangladesh, I think, or, or Pakistan. But anyway, he was doing his own little eugenics program, from what I could tell. Mm. Yeah. Mm. A Christmas tale. <laughs> well, this is all Scrooge. <laughs> it is. I mean, all these guys are Scrooge characters. But yeah, anyway, so this is. Yeah, but Scrooge saw a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and reformed, yeah. I can, I can definitely see, you know, Fauci seeing a ghost and reforming. I can see, you know, Peter Dozak seeing a ghost and reforming. Just while we're on that, Hugh, um, uh, I wanted to actually ask something. Uh, you about three days ago, you put up that article about the uh, attempt to get Dozak and. Gates and Fauci and all the rest of them into the International Criminal Court. And um, it was quite an interesting article. And I think you actually put something up today, didn't you? Something related to that. Um, actually, what I wanted to ask you was something a little bit to, to one side. You're, on that original post that you put on Reddit, um, uh about about the International Criminal Court case. Sometimes your your introductory blurb is is so cryptic. Uh, <laughs> but uh, actually, when I read it, I thought, "Are you?" I couldn't see whether you were trying to take the piss out of this article or whether you were were taking it as seriously as the article was was uh, was doing it. I, I just wanted to make the comment that, you know, sometimes I read I, your little things and I, I think what is, I, mean, I realise you're, you're clearly trying to say 20 different things at once in, in one sentence. I, I, I was you really know. trying to take the piss because they're not going to get anywhere. So these guys did actually mm. file in the ICC, but it's mm. like, that's not how the world works. <laughs> it's like anybody can file anything in the ICC. So it, it basically... Yeah, it's to, to actually get these guys, it, you know, it's it's a major political thing. It's it's it's, it's kind of like you know, fi filing something, in, you know, in the ICC against the Queen or something, or Prince Andrew or something like. It doesn't work that way. You can see with Prince Andrew, these these guys are Teflon, man. It's like the, the when these guys get taken down, it's because of an in, inside fight. It's because of a palace coup. But apart from court intrigue, I mean, I, I was taking the piss because it's just so naive. Again, it's this liberal bullshit. They actually think that there's a democracy and you can bring people to account and it's all about exposing it. And it's like, no, you could expose it all you like. It's not going to do anything. They don't give a rat's ass how exposed they are. But it, I just, it's so cute, you know, that, that, that people out there that think there's a rule of law and you can 
you can go to the ICC and <laughs> get and prosecute these bad people. It's like, no, they only did this shit because they have vast organizations like the CIA behind them. So it's like, you know, it's like, oh, I'm going to prosecute the CIA. And you go in your district court and file a complaint against the CIA. It's like, CIA owns America. You don't file a little thing against them. It's just pathetic. So I was taking the pitch because it's a joke, you know. I mean, I, I just I just thought, seriously, there are people that actually think this is the way that works. I mean, unless you see, unless you get somebody like Rand Paul or somebody like that that's an insider that, that has something to gain from this, it's like, what does it matter that a peasant just, you know, cast dispersions at a noble? It's like, yeah, peasants don't bring down nobles. It's like, come on, guys, you know, it's like that's not, not the game we're playing. Well, on the note of, of how America or various, but especially the American state is handling international crises and, and the false belief in that there is any type, anything with called justice, I told, I think I, I must have told you or Bob that I watched um, um, on a, for once I watched a Netflix film because I was with family and it was called Don't Look Up and you had put a, a link to that, um, to the trailer a few days ago on the sub. And I must say, really, that it's absolutely fabulous because it's exactly what we talk about, the reaction of CIA, uh, government, uh, media, social media to an international crisis with an extinction scenario. And it's just called don't look up because you just don't look up at what's happening. You just continue to look down and just don't continue on it. It's just spot on. I think it's an extinctionati movie in a way, you know, because it's uh, uh, except the end. But <laughs> I won't say anything. But yeah, and there's a guy who is impersonating uh, Elon Musk, and it's just—I mean, you'll see. Anyway, I, I usually don't praise Hollywood movies, but uh, I must say that for, for that one, I, I'd say my thumbs up because I don't know what's going to be the reaction. I think it's quite recent. I think most people I know have seen it are totally stunned. <laughs> really, I didn't know it would have such impact on people. But it, it marks a kind of a progress. There is a, this kind of slow progress. I mean, you, you can see it, that, that these normies are, are starting to realize that, you know, there is some shit that goes on. But it, it's it's really quite stunning. There, this this um, somebody somebody did some reply to one of the things that I, I did. I don't know who they are, but they, they weren't a bot. I thought it was just a bot at first, but they said, uh, oh, a typical anti-vaxxer conspiracy bullshit. And then they said, you know, they said, you know, I'm a project manager and say anybody that knows the real world and project management knows that, you know, conspiracy theorists are, are so quaint because they, they honestly think you can get a whole lot of people together and, you know, they can pull off a big plan like this and keep it secret and stuff. And I say, like, I, I, I'm just appalled that there are people that are that stupid. And now the mainstream, I mean, I think that that is kind of a mainstream view. And it's like, I, I, I wrote a reply there, but it's, it's just like, you know, in South Africa, we fought a war, a war for years in secret with the U.S. involvement. And they, these people actually think, you know, it's like, oh, you know, but somebody would spill the beans and run and tell project managers and then the project managers and all these white collar workers would be incensed and they would say no, no, no and get you. And it's like, for Christ's sakes, man, you, you can go and stand in the public square and shout these things and it's like nothing's going to happen. It's just, it's, you know, it's... Like, I mean, how stupid are you that these people still don't believe in conspiracy theories? It's, it's like, you know, it's like 9-11. It's like, what, was 9-11 was just, oh, it was just your average everyday occurrence of, you know, 15 guys hijacking four planes and flying them into the building. It was nothing unusual. I mean, what kind of a tinfoil hat idiot are you to think that there was something fishy going on behind that? Obviously, it was just a straightforward case of, 15 guys flying four planes in the buildings. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, how ridiculous that you tinfoil hat lunacy. Do you think that there was something fishy? <laughs> For Christ's sake, because... man. You, 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 you know, what world do you live in that you, that you don't know? 
that, that you can pull off and not there you've got a, a thing right in your face it's like you and you don't believe in conspiracies there was one that exploded literally into your face what the fuck yeah. is wrong with you man it's just it was interesting here uh, i was reading part three of paul king's north recent essay his his uh the vaccine moment was his uh, essay, and uh, in part of that, he says that the he says the uh, the conspiracy theorist is the the news storyteller, uh, pointing to something um, hidden, but the difference is that now it's uh, threatening the power structure, um, and uh, I was just rather intrigued that he made that little comment because. Uh, um, this idea of the conspiracy theorists is well. Well, I mean, uh, oh, but it's bullshit. It, I mean, this is pure King's <laughs> North bullshit. I mean, mm. this is what I'm talking about. This this quaint little liberal, you know, head up your ass idea that that you know, oh, it's it's threatening the power. What is threatening the power? This is like George Monbiot. It's like, mm. oh, you know, living living in this little fantasy land where what liberals say and think and the vote matters. It's like Monbiot obviously thinks that, yeah, we could expose these people and it would threaten them. It's like, what fucking planet are you on, Kings North? Mm, that you, you yeah, honestly think yeah. that these guys are threatened? This threatens mm. the power structure? What I, I, fucking I, I, way does this threaten the power structure just because some stupid journalists on the Guardian fucking sussed you? It's like they want you to suss them out because you can't do anything about it. And then they can stick it in your face Harder. They go from strength to strength. Every time you expose them and they get away with I mean, they went to war in Iraq. There was a conspiracy. They, they had a conspiracy to go to war in Iraq. They trumped up some reasons that were worse than the reasons the Nazis had for trumped up for invading Poland. The, the Nazis went to, at the Nuremberg trial. What they were charged with was waging, waging a war of aggression. And international law, that's the death penalty. Bush, Cheney, uh, Billy Crystal, and Wolfowitz, you know, Colin Powell, and Condor Sleazy Rice—they all, they all conspired to to start a war of aggression, unprovoked war of aggression. They should be hung, literally, under international law. What the fuck happened to Blair or any of them? Nothing. Absolutely fucking. But you see, once everybody knows it's a lie and everything, they go from strength to strength because now they've just said, like, you know, we can do whatever we want. Everybody knows it, and you can't do anything about it. So they're stronger. So the King's Norts and Monbiots and stuff, they're, they, they're playing into their hands. But um, <clears throat> just to, to mention, uh, Paul, you're mentioning Paul King's North. I think, I don't know if you've seen, but I sent you an email a couple of weeks ago, a week ago, that he just woke up, that we had invited him, and that he's happy to talk to us in January. So we'll be able to, to discuss his papers on the vaccine. I haven't read the third one. Um, <clears throat> but I, I just wanted to change the subject for a minute, if you don't mind. Um, I just wanted to, to share something that does go back to the sigil day and the the burning and all the different ceremonies that were posted and the moment we did it. Now, I felt personally very um, connected um, with you all guys. I don't know. It was, um, I, I'm not saying any woo-woo stuff there. Do you know, I just fe felt really uh, that it was a, a good thing that we decided all to to do that because there was some intensity in the, in the time because it was solstice. It was exciting. Um, a lot of us were outside. And not, you know, and I thought it was not everyone was outside, but nearly everybody. And uh, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, did you feel any of you the same? Well, it's hard to say, I suppose. I, I, I wasn't, I was a little bit sort of divided about, uh, because there was a, you know, the discussion about what kind of energy you're investing into the sigil, whether to funnel all your rage and energy and sense of injustice and all the rest of it. And uh, I, I didn't feel comfortable with doing that. Um, but it just kind of divided the divided it into two parts it was what I wanted to do. 
And then after I'd done that, was to invite in the energies of what everybody else was doing at the same time and just let that be whatever it was. Um, yet, and I think at that point, th there was a sense of, um, you know, in a certain way, you could feel the others there, you know, but I guess I'm not very sort of um, highly tuned into that kind of thing as other people might be. Yeah, um, I mean, when it happened, I, I don't know. There was I, I spoke with uh, Lionel actually before, and actually had things planned out, but um, mine had kind of a weird, like when I recorded it, there was a, like a glitch, and um, I don't know. I I felt it was sort of carefree. At at some point, I just let go. It's like whatever will be will be, and that will be my video. But um, I did come in with an intention and then just sort of, uh, I guess, as, as Lionel said, when, when you, uh, well, I burned the sigil, it, the energy dissipates and it goes into, you know, the group, I guess. But yeah, that's how I would say it. Yeah, I was hoping people would feel that connection. Yeah, I felt that connection. Um, yeah, in terms of, um, you know, the manifesto and, and just surviving the, the thing just for the extinction idea and as, as a group survival, it's, um, yeah, I, I think, uh, what we headed for and what the whole big, uh, the big arch of the story is, is how to actually survive what's coming. And so, you know, you have to think in terms of uh, as a huge filter, there's going to be a huge filter for humanity. And, you know, we kind of think of it as a, a lifeboat. So the idea of having uh, you know, an extended network of people around the world, I think, is the, is the right way to, um, to think about actually get, making it through all these challenges ahead. So, yeah, I mean... This whole thing about the pandemic is just the, f the first foretaste of, of of what's coming. But yeah, I, um, I think that we'll get stronger as as things go. But you know, the the basic thing, the basic mindset, and the whole reason I think for having the extinction idea is that you have to think in in terms of what is the unit of selection that's you know comes through the great filtering. The great filter is like the answer to the Fermi paradox. They say, well, why aren't there, why aren't there aliens that we've found on other planets? And the, um, you know, the, one of the answers is, uh, I think it was, um, I can't remember who came up with it, but they said, well, maybe there's a great filter. Maybe people never get over this stage where they're, they get the alien cortex and the, it wipes them out. Civilization wipes them out. It turns into Easter Island. And, Nobody makes it past uh, where we are now. Um, so really, it is, in a way, it's trying to, what we're trying to do, or at least what I'm trying to do in the, with the extension ID is trying to get through the great filter. And so you have to say, well, you know, what, you must ask, what, what is the unit of selection that makes it through? For example, if I gave you a, a thought experiment, would uh, take this for a strategy for getting through the great filter. Is it like, if you had lots of resources like a billionaire, could you just get uh, a few uh, skin cells or something? You know, use this tech that this Japanese guy just did about for making them pluripotent, using CRISPR Cas9 as to edit um, cells. Uh, that uh, make them, you know, turn them into stem cells so that they can be anything. So, so you could, you could clone yourself. So, you know, you'd say, you would just put a machine down a mine shaft, which would have all your like Craig Fenter like cells in it, in a petri dish. You know, it was it 
it would have a timer on it and then all these robotics would go to work to synthesize it you know they have wombs plastic wombs they've got they've i think they've just dated goats in a plastic bag and shit like that in an artificial womb so theoretically you could just you know have these stem cells down in a mine shaft somewhere get through you know the flippening and make it through the volcanic winter and then make it through the, the heat thing and then you know maybe in a hundred years it would just kick in and start uh, manufacturing itself and so you know you could get through with a clone that way and then you think well you know what what are we trying to get through are, are we just trying to make sure that a, a human gene gets through like the selfish gene right like so all these guys like price and hamilton and dickie dawkins and stuff all the selfish gene guys it's a wallet we just carry us for a gene you know you you could just basically get your dna as long as that made it through that would be you know, like through. is that what's behind that long now foundation do you think you know and their, the their now? thousand year the long now and their thousand year clock that's buried or going to be buried somewhere and will remain running regardless is that actually just not just a clock, but doing something else as well? Uh, no, it's possible because they're all sorts of nuts. They're, they're all sorts of weird shit going on. They're not. They're not going to tell you, but the guys, uh, so many guys have spent big money, get, you know, putting themselves in cryogenic suspension. See, Musk has uh, contributed to that project. Yeah, they, they're all hedging, yeah. right? So, but it's. I don't think. Yeah, it's. I mean, what it what it demands is that it says, you know, who who are you? What when you say I want to survive, you have to say what your genes or what? See, Price and Hamilton, all so it's a kind of a Darwinian question, and so it's like, can we make it through this Darwinian filter? And so Darwin took it as read that the unit of selection was was the the phenotype, in other words, the animal. So he thought, you know gazelles running through the fields as the gazelle is trying to procreate and propagate itself and so it's that's the test for darwinian test is can it reproduce before it dies and uh and then uh, you know it didn't really work out so you know price and fisher and that they put a lot of maths around it but haldane and fisher and those guys so haldane was the guy who said like um I think it was holding he said uh, you know he was the guy who said i would die for two brothers or like four cousins and so you know you say like okay if you think of us as the extinction ideas like i've said over and over again is like you will not make it through the great filter as an individual so that's why I'm, i write all these guys off um you know the musks and then all these rich guys they're all individualists, right? They'll never make it um, because, you know, they, they need their habitat. So so in answer to the question that the thought experiment I've just posed is you couldn't do that because if you actually had a machine that just cloned you in 100 years or something like that, it's it wouldn't be viable because you need human habitat. You need, you need so it's a, a way of seeing, like, what are you? Well, you, you're more than just... You know, Elon Musk in a body. You, you've got to, you know, you, you won't survive for very long without human habitat and without other humans. So you say, well, if you want to survive the great filters, like what? And you know, it's obvious. You just, you, you want a viable population and enough habitat. So that's that's the very basic unit. So once you do that, you. It makes no sense to be a prepper. Like all the preppers in America, they're all individualists. They all want to, you know, get in a bunker and so you're gone because you're going to merge out of that bunker. A, you're an individual, and B, you don't have any habitat. So it's not going to work. So you say, well, what, what is the unit of selection? And so, thing like all this thinking of the, the ego, egotistical thinking of the alien cortex. The alien cortex, I've said many times, is not going to make it through because the alien cortex thinks of itself as an individual and an ego. So there's no way an ego can survive in the, the, the great filter. You said, I think all these guys are making a mistake. Darwin, 
Galton, all these, so, so all of these guys, eugenicists, uh, the transhumanist eugenicists, all all of these these guys um, that that are probably doing some very naughty stuff. Um, they they're not going to survive because uh, they they made a mistake. They're Darwinists, right? They they, they come from Darwin, we're in Darwinian ideology. They can't really survive because they they the ideology is is wrong, and Darwin's ideology was wrong. So you say, well, what the the basic question? If you start asking, what's the basic unit of survival? What's the basic unit of selection? So they went through all these kind of paroxysms. All the Darwinists they said, well, you know, well, Hamilton ran into the problem of altruism and Hamiltonian spite and saying, like, where's the boundary of the unit of selection? What is the thing that's fighting? You know, where, where do you draw a circle around it and say, this this is the unit that's fighting for its existence? And if, if you start doing that, then you, you, you soon find that you run into trouble if you say it's the phenotype, if it's the animal, or like Darwin thought. So then, you know, they went and they said, well, it must be the gene. Then they came in the selfish gene. Then that didn't work. E.O. Wilson and those guys came and said, no, it doesn't, that doesn't work either because you, you've got all these kind of uh, examples of altruism all over the animal kingdom. They, they, they don't make any sense in that for a selfish gene. So, so Price and that came up with some maths that doesn't really work. But they say, well, you know, if you have a look at, say, an ant colony or something, it's you social. You say, well, is the ant colony? So is the colony the you know unit of selection? And then those guys are group selectionists, right? So Dickie Dawkins and the neo-Darwinists, they hate those group selection guys. So they say, like, you know, because it, it doesn't it makes a nonsense out of Darwin's theory for a group, because groups don't compete like animals do on the Serengeti. So so as you start to reflect on this, you say, well, what is the unit of selection? They said, there is none. That's why I made the videos on, on Darwin. Because there is no unit of selection. There is no unit. It's like, again, it's back to the beginning of this in Arjuna's vision. But what, what uh, Krishna was saying was, there's no unit of selection. It's, it's all just process. So... So then what does it mean for the extinction idea and you if you're actually going to make it through the great filter well it's it's basically you have to have habitat and you have to have humans and either the extinction idea or others but you say well you know what what happens if you if you're part of the extinction idea do you just join that group and then that um you know, then you're in a tribe, but you're really just trying to save your own skin. You say, no. It's, they, the extinction idea or anything that makes it through will be a Kantian whole. So a Kantian whole, if you recall, is that all the parts look after the whole, and the whole looks after the parts. The parts do look serve the whole, and the whole serves the parts. And so you say, well, if that happens, you know, you can slice it any way you like. You can you can slice it at the level of the forest or the tree or the cell in the tree or the organelle within the cell. It's it's like nothing makes any sense. It's a blur, and that's why Darwin's wrong. So you say, as the extinctionality, the way we are supposed to view ourselves is, is uh, an egregore that basically we take care of you know, the individual and the individual takes care of the extinction artist. So each extinction artist, it's, it's basically the three musketeers, all for one and one for all. And so the, that, that's, that um, kind of organization and, and ideology is, is what's most likely to make it through. Because it's, it's holistic. It doesn't, it doesn't admit to parts. See, Anybody that wants to make it through as an individual is not going to make it. And so the, these guys that are planning, they're they Neoplatonists, they're planning the noble lie. The reason why we don't have any democracy and stuff is because they, they long ago, if you go back to their history, 
they they read Plato. They read Plato's Republic. And if you read Plato's Republic, there's this bit about the noble lie, and what I don't think it's Socrates talking. I think it's Plato talking. But Plato in the Republic says, you know, you have to have the wise, the the golden guys, um, to frig all the elections. So you have to have they they have to control the ballot box and fool all the all the stupid dick dick wads, all the sheep for their own benefit. Now, if you go and have a look, they're all, you know, all the skull and bones guys, the guys at Harvard, the Bilderbergers, they're all Neoplatonists. And so they, they have always been for a long time pretending, you know, frigging the ballot box behind the scenes and pretending to the, the sheep to make sure that the, you know, the wires are the ones at the top. But if you think of that, if I'm right about the principle of what actually what's the unit of selection is, they can't make it through. Those, those Neoplatonists, they can't make it through because they're not organized properly as, uh, in terms of they, they an ego that are using the flock to get, in other words, they're kind of pharaonic. They, they, they're like, <clears throat> you know, the pharaoh's important. As long as you get the king or the pharaoh through, that's, <coughs> that's all that matters. <coughs> you know, basically everybody else is expendable. But you can see what's why they can't make it that way. Because the environment is expendable and the people are expendable. The king cannot exist. It's a contradiction. Because the king can't exist without the people and, and, and the kingdom and the environment. So they're all making a gargantuan mistake. They're trying to preserve the king. And so, you know, they will depopulate the world. <coughs> They've got it in plan. <coughs> you can, you know, if you, you know they're going to do it. If they haven't already, if the fertility crisis and well, those pandemics and stuff isn't part of the depopulation problem, you know they're going to do it sometime. But you see, it's like, what do they wind up at the other side of? I don't think they can get through. So who makes it through is somebody who thinks like the extinction RD and think in terms of a group of people that, you know, all for one and one for all and not not gaming, not gaming the system. Can I uh, uh, just say something there? That um, the the process that that we shared with the uh, um, investing intention and, and energy into the sigil, uh, which we were just talking about. You know, did anyone feel a sort of connection to the others? Do you think, in view of what you've just been saying, that that's something that we should be repeating fairly often to to strengthen the connection? Because it, it can really only be done that way between us because of the physical separation. Um, and that, you know, we, we, it, we should be devising some, some uh, kind of, uh, you know, I don't know what you want to call it, some kind of ceremony or, or something where we do that as a regular uh, yes it would a, reg be good. a regular thing um, be, and also celebrate the solstice both solstices we should have a ceremony but we should also have an initiation ceremony into into the extinction army. we'll get there but you know I mean I think it probably that what makes sense is like a Dunbar's number worth of people if, any, if you get any more than a Dunbar's number's worth, then I think you probably have to split off, make a new chapter or something like that. But, you know, you can you see, again, there's no unit of selection. So even, even that's not really correct. Because if you had more than a Dunbar's number of people and you split off into another chapter, you would still have allegiance to the, to the bigger entity. So this... Well, see, ultimately, you know, isn't, isn't the... Uh... The viable group that you were talking about is, in fact, the cosmic particle that you were talking about earlier. You know, yeah, it's, it's the whole a, thing. What, yeah, you want consciousness not to... The light of consciousness is what you're really trying to preserve and get through the great filter. And so you can't really get through, you know... I mean, the idea of uploading yourself to silicon is ridiculous because there's no consciousness in silicon, so it would be, would be a silly copy. Be like trying to, you know, get a photographic representation or 
digital image of a person and say, hey, we survived. <laughs> say, no, we didn't. What I don't understand is, are these people who are trying to do that, are they, are they legitimately so, so uh, oh, I don't know what the word is, are they so dumb? Stupid? Are, yes. Yeah, breathtakingly stupid, that they haven't tried to imagine themselves into a, a, a situation like that. Like even the other day when you uh, posted the thing about Dolly the sheep, you know, which, of course, everyone had heard about but probably forgotten until you reminded us. And, of course, obviously, since then, somewhere, somehow, they've, they've also cloned human beings. It's just that they're not going to own up to that. And, uh, you know, like, t just personally, um, well, I remember there was a science fiction, sort of comedy science fiction thing, uh, The Red Dwarf. I don't know if you ever saw any of, of those episodes. And in yeah, one of those yeah. episodes, the, uh, the, the very... Yeah, Rimmer, the, the most egotistical prick in, in the universe, ended up marooned alone or something like that, and he cloned all these copies of himself. Of himself, um, And, of course, <laughs> it was a riot. <laughs> it was a total disaster. Uh, but, you know, the, the mental exercise is worth going through of thinking of something like that. If you could clone mm -hmm. yourself, and then you had to raise yourself, and 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 uh, you will be able to see immediately. There's so many reasons why that clone person would never be you, uh, and could never be, and there was to be no way you could bring it about. Um, those those kind of little mental, uh, you know, exercises you kind of wonder whether this, these people have ever just sat down and tried to do that for even a minute, um, that they're just forging ahead into this this fantasy um, of, of, you know, being able to preserve themselves literally kind of thing. Uh, you know, just sort of wake up yeah. and go, oh, I'm here and it's 2,000 years later. How lovely, you know. Um, yeah, well, well um, so Socrates went through all of this and so the, in the Phaedo, um, where where he actually takes the hemlock, he goes through exactly this exercise, and also in the symposium, and, and this, but particularly in the Phaedo, where he's saying about you know what what is the immortal soul, um, and so he's saying you know like well if you propagated yourself you you do have a kind of immortality in kids, you you know you have children but they obviously different individuals they're not really you, so it's like. You know, is there immortality for you personally? It's the alien cortex, right? Asking, is can can it survive? Um, and it's it's the crux of the question is you know the Gilgamesh question and stuff. It's it's the the alien cortex wants wants to survive because it's self-preserving, right? The whole reason it exists is because it's a self-preservation module, so it's self-reinforcing and self-preserving, and so the just uh, just the attempt of the extinction arty to get through the the great filter is the alien cortex trying to preserve itself the, the gotcha is that you could never make it through <laughs> unless you ditch the alien cortex that's the big gotcha but you can lure it in by saying you know you promise immortality you, uh, the price of immortality immortality is the death of the alien cortex see it's basically, basically it's by by giving up yourself as an individual and realizing, yeah, well, your identification is really with the, with consciousness. And yeah, it seems to be a case of it, all over the place. Yeah. But you, you can have what you want, but only if you don't actually want it. Um, yeah, so you can have you know. your life if losing it. I mean, it's literally said that in the Bible. That's what it says in the mm. New Testament. So uh, only those that you know. Uh, that lose their lives will keep them. But the, yeah. that's uh, so. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Is but you see the the whole point of this this trial that we're going to go through and the flipping is is it the really the flipping from a psychological point of view is that you no longer identify with yourself as an individual walking around in the big world. You think of yourself as the big world, and you kind of lose attachment to individual so you you flip 
positions, you know, if, uh, exterior, what you think of as exterior becomes interior, what you think about interior becomes exterior and foreign. So, you know, the everybody thinks of themselves as the, the egos, as the, the real, and the, the rest of the world almost like a dream, like Maya, like the illusion of the, like a movie. So it's, kind of like if you have virtual reality glasses and you're wandering around in the metaverse then you think the metaverse is not real it's just computer generated and you're an individual who is real wandering around after your personal transformation you will think of it the other way around is you are the metaverse and you, you're generating this illusion of an individual wandering around so the avatar is not real. Everybody has it the wrong way around. They think the avatar is real and the big world is, is imaginary, illusory. And then it's the other way around. It's like you're really the big world and the avatar is the, the unreal. So that in this, so that is the secret to getting through, um, you know, the great filter. Um, but you know you can't. The reason why it's a it's a full on total challenge is that you don't get to bullshit yourself, King's North style. <laughs> mm. and, uh, all these guys like Darren and stuff. All these guys lying to themselves, just telling themselves stories and being superior. And was like, ah, oh, uh, no, no, you don't get to do that because it's physical too. See, the physical cuts out the bullshit. You can tell yourself any story you like, but we have to literally go through a flipping of the world. The geographic poles flip. So, like, the nonsense ends right there. <laughs> there's, there's no room for bullshit. You, you can't just say, no, oh, I believe in God, or who gives a fuck? You still have to get through the volcanic winter, asshole. So all of these things are kind of conceits, right? But at the end of this process, there's no, no conceits left. If anybody makes it through, they will make it through as a clean slate. Because you can't, if you have any hubris left at the end of this trial, it's like, you're not going to make it. You'll never make it through. So it's it's a total challenge. It's it's an, it's a, it's the, it's a complete challenge you, you don't get to set your own goals and bullshit yourself and introduce jesus <laughs> it's like nah harry potter stuff you upload to silicon it's like go for it upload yourself to silicon it's like you know yes you're dead you're out of the game it's like being on the titanic it's like you know like like faulty and stuff it's like well we'll find a dry cabin and so Britain will do the right thing. We'll make a stand and we'll be environmentally conscious. Like, who gives a shit? Your cabin's going to go down with the Titanic. So it doesn't help you. Like, oh, I'm not going to talk about China because we don't live in China. It's like, yeah, maybe you don't. But you're going down with China. <laughs> you can't. All these uh, guys like XR thinking, you know, we, we're going to have, you know, have the perfect little cabin on the Titanic. Really? You're going to have a waterproof cabin on a sinking ship. Well, cool, but you're not going to make it through. You're not going to make it through. You, you just, you're going to die. And you're, just, you're just selecting how you're going to die. And you're going to die like a fool sitting in a cabin and get, get, gets crushed when the Titanic gets to about 3,000 feet below, below the sea. <laughs> so you're an idiot. All these guys, Christians, the... XR, the Michael E. Mann, the geoengineers, they, they're just selecting you know, how the stupid, stupid strategy. They're just selecting their strategy for death. Jim Bendel is going to take coup. He's, he's not going to make it through. Him and everybody associated with him, you can see what they're going to do. They're going to take the coup out. So it's a, it's a huge test to see, you know, who's, who's the stupid idiot. It's an IQ test. And the IQ test is, ultimately, the IQ test is, can you identify the selectable unit? The unit of selection is what survives. 
Is it your gene? Is it a cell of yours? Is it your mind? Is it your body and mind? Is it your soul? Is it you and a, and a group of people? Is it a viable population and a bit of habitat? What is the thing that survives? You get that question wrong, <laughs> you're out of the game. <laughs> be eliminated with lots of sackcloth and gnashing of teeth. And, it, and the biggest booby prize of all is if, uh, you know, going back to Arjuna and Krishna on the field of, of Kurukshetra, is, is it, the worst conceit of all is to say like, ah, it doesn't matter. Something will survive. There'll be slime molds that survive. And, you know, it's like, it might take another million years of billion years of evolution, but one day there'll be people It's like, nah. What I have to say to you is Venus. <laughs> Venus is sterilized today, and it was once just like Earth is now. That, that's the, the biggest booby prize of all, this, this false kind of Zen. But, okay, everything is one, and, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's like, well, that's, that's the worst sin, that one, because that's such a close mess. <laughs> it's, it's almost like uploading yourself to silicon. It's a, it's a dream, dream strategy. Anyway. Yeah, I was uh, funny only thinking the other day that... Uh probably uh, Mars too, <clears throat> uh, that Earth was probably the, the last remaining uh, refuge. Um, you know, whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's an interesting thing to ponder. Uh, they, they, uh, did you read that thing a, a while ago about how they found radioactive material on Mars? that could only have originated from an atmospheric atomic blast. Um, that there would, uh, you know, whether or not there was any, you know, conclusion from it, I don't know. Um, it just kind of make you, makes you think that, you know, Mars and Venus might have had this kind of life on them once, and they kind of blew it and ended up on Earth. Uh, and uh, this is the last last option you know i i didn't hear the thing about mars they mm. um i think it, last year they 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 got all excited because they thought that they found traces of bio biochemicals in the oh, upper okay. atmosphere of venus then the, yeah they, this, they, this they decided that wasn't true i wouldn't give a lot of store to mars having a um a fission <clears> blast <throat> in the atmosphere because it's been bombarded by alpha particles, beta particles. And so yeah. it's it's like a long, slow nuclear reaction. So over mm. millions of years, it might look like uh, it suffered. It might look like it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, I, it, it's possible that um, life really did start on Venus and we, we're remnants. Mm. Um, but yeah, e either way, it's, it's it's not really important, except that um, Venus seems to be going through what we. Well, it seems like it went through what we've been going to go through. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah. it's 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 a frightening place, Venus. But I mean, uh, yeah, all of these things are kind of lessons. It's it's a good thing to look at all of these strategies, like Musk's strategy to go and you know go to Mars. Well. You see, that's doomed because there's no human habitat. So it's it's like, you know, the, the spaceman trying to get to Mars um, without his habitat. It's not going to work. So it, it only works when you, you have habitat plus viable population. So th those yeah. guys are as good as toast anyway. But anyway, you can see, I keep on posting stuff to just remind people how batshit crazy uh, the average person is that think we're going to Mars. It's like, they, I, I put that thing up there that just said, you know, the, like space medicine, that they find that their permanent 
there's permanent alteration to your brain in, in microgravity after you've been up there. For, so it's not viable. You know, Mars is, doesn't have enough gravity. So it's, it, I mean, it's, it, you know, so, so maybe these guys say, oh, we'll genetically engineer. It's like, genetically engineer? What the hell are you talking about? Do you, you know the genes for making a brain? You don't. It's complete horseshit. It's, it's just, they, they, I'm telling you, these people are utterly, utterly mad. The average person is utterly, utterly insane. And the, the, the more educated and, you know, Nobel Prize laureates and that, the more insane they are. There are very, very few people that just, like, tell you the obvious. Well, we're not going to space. <laughs> space is extremely hostile. So it's, it's no place for a primate. But this is all just a, uh, a, 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 a but these guys are spending millions on this shit. But it's just a first world fantasy anyway, you know. I mean, yeah, the idea got, that you can just trash this and then move on, like, oh, like yeah. that's a natural progression and stuff. Like, well, dudes, you, you're not going to make it out of the Van Allen belt, man. You go and have a, mm. yeah, we got to the moon on a suicide mission. They, they don't, NASA never told people that NASA encouraged because NASA wanted its budget. It never told people that all of this stuff is just a, a stunt. Going to the moon and stuff is just a wild, crazy, kamikaze stunt. And they didn't share that with people. But the astronauts knew that they had a 50-50 chance of dying. All of them almost died. So, like, they are under no illusion that you're never going to get space tourism. You know, I mean, sure, you can get in low Earth orbit. But, they, yeah, it's kind of like a, a flight on Concord. It's basically Virgin Atlantic and going up and coming down is your luck. But you, can't, you can't stay on a space station. You're definitely not going to live on Mars. So it's like crazy talk, crazy. But like, how, how is it that, you know, you can, you can blabber on about all this bullshit and, and nobody will call you on it. You know, it's it's the, the standard dialogue of, the, of progress. We must go into the Star Trek future. And it's like, it's like, one, a few things are absolutely certain, and one of them is we have no Star Trek future. But who will come out and say it? Can, uh, can I bring in something hypothetical here, uh, which is a little bit related to space travel, I suppose, uh, which is, uh, you know, a couple of times I've read about people with extraordinarily, extraordinarily advanced cities, you know, a cult or, or uh, paranormal powers who can um, transport themselves physically from one part of the planet to the other and, you know, accomplish some, some pretty remarkable things. And uh, I was actually wondering about uh, people who are capable of doing that kind of thing and uh, certain lone wolf monkey wrenching events which have occurred um, uh, which nobody's been able to work out who did it or anything. And have you ever considered that people like that might be involved in that kind of uh, behaviour? Yeah, you see, the, the, uh, I don't have anyone in mind, of course, no one at all. <laughs> well, I don't do it, but the, 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 I know the, you don't. I know. The, the, <laughs> but the, you see, the thing is, why would you do that, right? So. It's kind of like, say, you know, it's kind of like trying to save the alcoholic from his drink. So it's, it's like, you know, saying like, you know, would you actually use your cities to go to a bar to prevent some alcoholic getting his next cocktail? It's like, why? What's the point? See, the, the story unfolds in a much bigger way. Than, than those those kind of actions, right? The, that kind of individual action is pointless. It's it's the same as uh, all these activists and stuff, and it's it's the same kind of thing. Is like okay, let's just say your dream scenario comes true and you become czar of the world. Like now what? You still got the same freaking problems as the bad guys. You know, that's every revolutionary finds that they will wind up with the same problems as the ancient regime. And then they go, oh, now we understand you. Oh, well, fuck, we'd have wasted a lot of time with that revolution. You should have just explained it to us. I think that's what that uh, newspaper fellow was saying in that interview, uh, the South African um, fellow, 
about what the, the ANC discovered when they got into power was that they didn't have much power. Uh, you know, and they all got themselves into the same knots that everybody gets into. Them. Yeah, the, the ANC yeah. found that. You see, Mandela found that. You see, he, all of these guys, he came in with them, all, all being communists and idealists and all these grand plans. But as soon as they got to power, the first thing they realized was, oh, shit, we have to stop capital flow. So you're saying like, you know, okay, the, we'll, we'll, we'll put communism on a back burner and we just need to keep the, make sure that our credit rating is okay. As soon as they were, were in the game of keeping the capital in the country and keeping their credit rating up, they were capitalists. And they still are today because you can't get out of that. <laughs> In some, in some ways, the, the Afrikaners were, were very stupid that they didn't uh, just hand over the country early. If, if, in like around about 1948, if they just handed over the country to, to, to all the black guys, they, you know, they, they would have found they had the same problems. And you know, they, you know, they could have managed it. The reason why they didn't do it was because they were trying to protect all the, the poor white brethren. And so, so, yeah, again, it was the ego identification. So it was where they drew the ego boundary. So the, so the, the Afrikaners drew the ego boundary around white Afrikaans. And look how much trouble that caused in that part of the world. And so, you know, all these uh, transhumanists and that, they draw an ego boundary around themselves. It's even worse. Anyway. I guess we should stop uh, there, unless somebody's got something more to say. So anyway, the, I just want to say one more thing. That is we, you mentioned the clones and stuff like that. So <clears throat> oh, the clones can't really survive. It's very dangerous. What they're doing, that thing I posted about the clones, Dolly the sheep and all of these um, cloned animals in, in South America, all the all the McDonald's burgers and stuff, they, they're clones. They, they're secret. They don't tell you. But the, the, but um, here's the problem with that, is that uh, it's the same as line breeding. So it works great if you get a champion cow or something and you, may, and you just clone it. But you see, if you've got a her herds of identical animals, they're very, very vulnerable to disease. And so that's really one of the problems why we are getting pandemics is the human genome is not diverse enough. So we, we uh, you know, as humans, we're all kind of susceptible to the same viruses. So we're all kind of in the same boat. Uh, we need more heterogeneity. And so the same applies with, uh, say, the extinction army. You, instead of being all the same, one of the, like, the socialists and the national socialists, why are they not going to survive is they're too heterogeneous, so they're kind of like, you know, they don't have enough diversity. Like you're saying, you, you really want lots of complementary skills and a heterogeneous crowd, and that's, that's the most viable. Uh, did you um, uh, have any luck inviting Hank to come back, or what happened there? I didn't even try. <laughs> I, know, I was only thinking about it because you made a comment somewhere just just to look. you made a post. I'm not quite sure I understood what it was about, but you know. I think so. I, I you know, I I think I'll just get the manifesto finished, and then everybody can mm. review what they think about it. And then I think I think that's the next step. And then then I think we should start trying to popularize it more, try and um, advertise it more. Uh, but I think we first need the the uh, the manifesto so we can just point people to it so that we can say this is what we're about. And then it's I, I also wanted I also wanted to thank Bob for the podcast idea because it's first it's a it's a beginning and it would be great if we could manage to to get all the the stuff on podcast and maybe uh, with a I don't know is it a good idea to monetize the podcast but. I, I know yeah. that a lot of a lot of people do that. A lot of groups I listen to do that. They put little little snippets of their podcast, and then if you want to listen to the whole, because 
You see, with the attention span of people, advertising straight away two or three hours talks might be, um, uh, you know, how people are. I mean, uh, and uh, so, you know, if we could think along those lines one day, having a, a kind of 10 minutes or five minute little um, for every meeting or every podcast. And I don't know, what do you think? I think it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, I uh, suggested that once before that we sh should, uh, uh, I, I mean, just try and do it, just bring it in rather gently, uh, you know, maybe just one one meeting out of every month, just put up the first 15 minutes of it and just say, oh, it'll cost, it'll cost a dollar to see the rest of it and just see if you get uh, any interest because a dollar is a trivial, it's not really that much of a barrier but it's a way of gauging that people will go an extra step. And uh, uh, I, I'm just wondering whether possibly, I don't know how you could do it, but um, uh, you know, maybe keep it, some meetings in reserve that haven't I, been broadcast well, until Russell we Brand come. Does it. Russell Brand. Yeah, does Russell. It. Yeah, Russell. No, what I'm thinking now. Then he just does yeah, teasers. But, you can yeah, but he's got part. very, um, uh, very nicely structured. Uh, you know, he he he. Do, it's not sort of free form like what we're doing, um, and so he can sort of script it so that at the fifteen minute point where he cuts it off, he knows bloody well that that, that we're just about to launch into a really juicy piece of the the discussion, which we, we don't know that. Um, uh, but that's why I was thinking maybe what we should do is hold up some of our meetings until we've got, say, three or four that haven't been broadcast. Pick uh, one. No, I think it would be better to just go and edit, edit out the good bits. Oh, well, yeah, you could, but th that's work as well. Um, you could well, do that. Well, or, uh, Russell Brand and stuff must have a team behind. Oh, yeah, obviously, yeah. He's he's making enough out of it and he's got a lot of help. It's obvious. He couldn't he couldn't produce a result like that all by himself. Um, uh, but no, that's why I was just thinking to keep one, to just to pick one of our meetings out of a few that we've kept aside uh, that's particularly interesting and use that as the, as the test one to see if this process will work, you know. Um, you know, one where you're just about to launch into a major thing about uh you know the the hiv link or something something like that you know um and then just at the point where you're about to say something we cut it off and, and use that as the one to to uh to try so with, bloody you know. marketing bloody marketing you see you see well, Hank, well, yeah you market it you market it to faulty we can stoop that low we, we're all set around being being um very obedient salespersons for mr faulty oh, yeah. so you know. Marketing can vomit, but yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. Hank, Hank, Hank is in marketing, you see. So that, so he always wanted to do all of this stuff, mm. and uh, I wasn't quite ready for it. I thought we were, we're not really at this stage. But I think I now. See Bob has, I see Bob has posted that he can chop a few minutes that sound good and pop them up on the podcast, and also he said that. Patreon already allow you to make the podcast a subscription thing. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's better to get some some bits, keep them out of the podcast, and then just put them yeah. for, for money on Patreon or something. Yeah. Secret need thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's another thing is we could make uh, different classes of knowledge. So. Yeah, the inner yeah. circle thing. <laughs> yeah, because well, the, the inner inner circle that we were going yeah. to do ages ago. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I, I think we, we still we should still get there. We should still do that. Well, I think we've established that more uh, more uh, closely too, because you could uh, uh, just simply go down the list of people who who contributed to the the sigil thing recently. Um, and I think you've already got your, your, you already know who the inner circle is, is those people who are interested enough, you know. Um, so we've defined that much more closely than, than, uh, than it was months ago. Yeah, people, people love grades and initiations and stuff like mm. that. So I would, mm. I, uh, I think the, we should use the, um, 
the Mithraic grades. So the, the Mithraic and the Mithraim and stuff is very good to raid because nobody really knows what they're doing. But you, I, I can interpret a lot of the Torobolium and stuff like that. It's all astrology and stuff like that. So, so yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I know what they're doing. But since since everything's a bit fragmentary about them, you can kind of raid them because people don't really, you know, it's kind of like if you if you raid the Freemasons or something like that, then everybody knows. Everyone knows. Everybody yeah. agrees on stuff. But it's very nice to have seven grades of the Mithraim and people know, know what they are, but don't know the details, but I'm pretty sure I know what the details, I can guess what the details are. So it's a good, it's a good thing to, to use. Yeah. Anyway, all right. Well, let's call it a day then, should we? And uh, okay, so next week is New Year's on Saturday, is it? What is it? Yeah. Yeah. So, are people going to be around? Anybody celebrating the night before? We might, you might see for the Eastern meeting because I don't yeah. know if I'll be able to record at half past six because I might have. Well, New maybe year. maybe we just do a, a, the Western meeting again next Sunday because it's like yeah. I was, it was tough this morning with the alarm clock. I tell you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was uh, no, it wasn't happening. <laughs> but yeah. I went back I to bed it. afterwards anyway. So. so one one meeting, one meeting next. next yeah, Sunday good because, idea. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> all right, everyone. All right, let's, so let's just right. pause and let's let's stop. Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Right. Okay. Bye. See you in 2022. 2022. <laughs>